What if you could make your brain act like a supercomputer that churns out perfect decisions flawlessly so that every time you're faced with a do I don't die choice, you make the right move. What would happen to your productivity and your performance over the years as in each of those little micro decisions you get faced with throughout the day, you took the optimal path. Now I'm Rio Doris, co-founder and CEO of the Flow Research Collective. Along with my partner, Stephen Collar, we've taught thousands of professionals how to access states of flow at will. You know that horrible feeling of not being able to decide. You keep swinging between decisions in one moment thinking you've made up your mind, then later realizing that you actually haven't. Well, the reality is this is what happens when you're stuck making decisions in a way that the average knowledge worker is conditioned to do so. I first experienced this as a teenager. In Ireland, your entire future hinges on a single week of exams at the end of high school. Your performance during those few days determines what college you'll get into, period. No interviews, no resumes, just those exam results. So every moment leading up to that week is precious, precious study time. But there I was, fixated on what to major in instead of prepping for the tests that would determine my future. I was torn between philosophy and business, two paths that felt completely at odds. I made dozens of pros and cons lists that always seemed evenly split down the middle, never landing decisively on one side or the other. I thought about it constantly, ruminating during class when I should have been taking notes, staying up late into the night, staring at the ceiling. The uncertainty ate away at me. And this was just one decision as a teenager. The problem wasn't the decision itself. The real problem was my decision-making process in general. I was relying on an analytical, deliberate form of decision-making, which blocked me from making decisions in a more effortless and intuitive way. It turns out I was relying on the wrong system in my brain. That's when I learned about the two modes of thinking and thus deciding, discovered by Israeli-American psychologist Daniel Kahneman. System one is an intuitive, automatic mode of thinking that's fast and effortless. This is intuition, it leverages the subconscious. It's when a manager sees leadership potential in a junior employee, promotes them despite their lack of expertise, and the employee thrives in the new role. Now, system two, on the other hand, is a conscious, logical, and deliberate, and it's slow, but effortful. This is deliberation. It often shows up when you carefully weigh the options and analyze the pros and cons of a decision. The trouble is we tend to over-index on system two and it slows us down, increases our stress and degrades our performance. This causes you to get stuck in self-doubt, which erodes your confidence, decreases your focus and makes you prone to progress sapping distractions. Worst of all, this keeps on happening. From one decision to the next, you get trapped in this cognitively draining loop of doubt. This is what happened to me as a student in Ireland when trying to decide what to do in college. Then one weekend, I decided I'd go hiking in the Irish countryside to clear my head. I started sprinting down a mountain trail, jumping between rocks. As I ran down the hill, I entered an intense flow state, that feeling of being in the zone. I was effortlessly navigating the rocky terrain by intuition alone. The decision of where to place my feet on each precarious rock became completely automatic and unconscious. It was just happening. In this flow state, my prefrontal cortex, the region of the brain that orchestrates our conscious, deliberate decision-making was taking a back seat. And this is a phenomenon known as transient hypofrontality, a temporary quieting of the part of the brain that during regular consciousness would be intensely deliberating each step. Instead, my system one thinking was in charge, jumping from rock to rock, making split second decisions with ease that felt almost like no decision maker was present. This disappearance of the sense of self, our inner monologue, that nagging voice you have in your mind, this is a key characteristic of flow state. When you're one with the wave like the surfer or one with the mountain, like I was that day, bizarrely, there is no self. There is no sense of self-consciousness present to make decisions in a deliberative way. So my brain was relying on faster, more efficient pattern recognition an instinct from lower brain regions like the basal ganglia and amygdala. This leads to more automatic and shoot of system one thinking. I reached the bottom of the mountain, exhilarated. As I caught my breath, I couldn't help but wonder, hey, hold on a second. Why can't I make decisions about what course to do in college in the same intuitive, effortless way I decided which rock to place my foot on as I sprinted down that hill? Here I was agonizing over philosophy versus business when moments ago, I had intuitively navigated highly consequential footsteps on a mountain. If one wrong step could have broken my neck, but the flow state led me to perfect decisions without thinking. The stakes were much higher on the mountain, yet choosing a college major felt impossible. I realized that the problem wasn't my decision-making ability. 
The problem was that I didn't know how to apply that flow-like intuition to decisions outside of flow, even though my brain was clearly capable of doing so, as demonstrated by my sprinting down the mountain. So the question is, is there a way to pull that fast, flawless decision-making approach out of flow, the type of decision-making you tap into when you're skiing, surfing, and running, and use it anytime? Well, fast forward to today. I now am fortunate enough to have 60 employees, two businesses, and I have to make 100 times the amount of decisions that my teenage brain had to make back in the day with unimaginably higher stakes. If I was leaning on system two, deliberation, still making decisions the way I used to, it would be physically impossible for me to have time to do anything but making decisions nowadays. So I had to learn how to lean on system one, intuition, and to balance between both systems. And here's why this matters so much. Flow is an optimal state of consciousness where we feel and perform our best, which is the reason why we perform at such a high level in flow is due to the near perfect intuitive decision-making that happens while in the state. It is system one operating at its peak. You know what this is like. To take an example, you're a writer working intensely on a complex passage. The right phrasing seems just out of reach until you get into flow. Suddenly, everything clicks. Your fingers fly across the keyboard as the perfect words come to you intuitively. It's like the text is writing itself, hours passing by in a blink as you draft an entire chapter. This is system one decision-making at its best. Insight and expression flowing seamlessly with minimal conscious thought perturbing it. But here's the crazy thing. There's a way to tap into this high level intuitive decision-making that we get in flow even outside of actually being in a flow state. As flow researcher, Lowry Yervileto of Alto University put it, flow can be thought of as intuitive action, whereas intuition in turn can be construed as cognition in flow. In other words, intuition is what powers our decision-making in flow. And that flow-based intuition can power all our thinking and decisions, not just the ones made in flow. This is called flow-based decision-making. Flow-based decision-making means harnessing the fast, flawless intuition of flow and applying it to all choices with the perfect blend of system one and system two with, of intuition and deliberation. It leverages your subconscious, but you also get the most out of the conscious mind without it becoming an obstacle. It's like having the batting skills of a pro baseball player able to hit the ball in the blink of an eye, even when you're not in the middle of the game. The result, you make more decisions, make them faster and make them better without expending unnecessary cognitive energy. To be clear, we're not telling you to randomly start going with your gut and making rash decisions. As you'll see, flow-based decision-making requires rigor, prep, and diligence at its outset so you can harness subconscious processing and intuition. So how do we do this? How do we take this form of decision-making out of flow state and apply it everywhere to elevate the quality of our decision-making across our lives? Well, here's the step-by-step -step process to master flow-like decision-making. The first stage, the flow-based decision-making process is to give your subconscious a target. Imagine this. You're General Eisenhower in the lead up to D-Day. You've got the greatest army the world has ever seen, boats, planes, and your mind is full of incredible military strategy. Now let's say you misdiagnose the problem, thinking that the main German defense is their air force. So you decide to invest heavily in anti-aircraft measures. You deploy the troops, hit the beaches, and are instantly mowed down by fortified machine gun nests. Why? Because you made a decision based on solving the wrong problem. In reality, the strongest part of the German army was not their air force. Eisenhower, thankfully, didn't make this mistake. He understood the root problem, the Atlantic Wall, a massive system of fortifications built by Nazi Germany along the western coast of Europe from Norway to Spain. The real challenge was not just the German army, but how and where they were fortified. So he made a decision to invest in massive artillery and specialized engineering teams trained to destroy obstacles, turning the Atlantic Wall into more of a speed bump than a blockade. The decision was only as good as the problem it was designed to solve. A decision is nothing more than the selection of a solution to a problem. That's what a decision fundamentally is. You can think of the problem as a lock and the decision as a key. You can't make a key that unlocks a lock if you don't know the lock's shape and structure. And the same goes for flow-based decision-making. Without identifying the root problem, you're like a surgeon in an operating room hacking away at the wrong organ unknowingly. In this way, your decisions are only as good as how precisely you are able to identify the problem. This was evident during my sprint down the mountain. In a state of flow, I effortlessly navigated 
the precarious terrain through split second decisions. This hyper fast intuition worked because the problem was unambiguously and clearly defined right in front of me, where to place my feet on each upcoming rock. The objective was crystal clear. That's what we're going for here. This is how flow based decision making kicks in. With such an explicitly defined problem, both systems one and two, your conscious and subconscious, know exactly where to apply their efforts. So when the root problem is vague, your mental resources scatter. And if you don't clarify the problem, you might be trying to solve a problem that doesn't even exist or trying to solve a different problem. Even as we speak, you might be blindly walking around trying to solve things you've spent no time trying to find out the root cause of. It's like furiously scooping water out of a sinking boat with a bucket, but you never look for the hole in the boat that's causing the leak. The water keeps filling up and you're trapped in an endless loop of bucket scooping. It's staggering when you think about the time we sink into tackling these phantom problems. To avoid this trap, it helps to separate the symptom from the problem. For example, I remember a while back, I was trying to figure out what car to buy. Seems simple enough, just compare models of various cars. So I spent a weekend test driving some new cars, comparing specs and asking friends what they thought, investing a bunch of brain cycles on the decision with system two, deliberative thinking. But one morning, as I sat in nonstop traffic, trying to get to work yet again, it hit me. The real issue wasn't what car to buy, but how to reliably get to work each day, no matter the traffic. As soon as I reframed the problem from choosing a Tesla or a Mercedes to solving my transportation to work, a whole new range of options opened up. I could carpool, bike, take public transport, or even just work from home. The perceived problem or symptom was which car should I buy? The root problem was how do I reliably get to and from work? Another time, I was having a hard time trying to decide whether to hire one person or another for a key role on my team. Both candidates seemed qualified in their own ways. One candidate had great technical skills, but she had less experience. The other had tons of experience, but his tech skills were not as sharp. In the meantime, customer support inquiries were building up. The pressure didn't help. It made me second guess the decision even more. And then it dawned on me. What I really needed was just something to handle customer support. Once I realized this was the core, the root problem, I could expand out the options. Maybe I could set up an FAQ page, tweak the onboarding process to reduce customer queries, deploy an AI chatbot, or even outsource the whole customer service function. The perceived problem or symptom was whether to hire person A or B, the root problem was to ensure all customer inquiries were responded to. So the key is drilling down to the actual underlying problem, not just a surface level. Now, once you've separated the symptoms from the root problem, let yourself linger with the problem before jumping to solutions. Spending time in the problem space is uncomfortable because naturally we want the problem to be solved, but rushing to a solution bypasses the essential incubation period, which we'll cover in a moment. The critical mistake is to jump to solutions too fast, which limits all creativity and defeats the purpose of flow-based intuition. Just as you don't want to define the problem incorrectly, you don't want to decide prematurely on a less effective solution. You've only just clearly defined the problem and the brain's pattern matching abilities need time to find the best solution. By lingering with the root problem, your subconscious mind continues to process and examine a problem even when you're not actively thinking about it. Now the next stage of the flow-based decision-making process is to recruit the silent operator. Consider this analogy from advisory board member to us at Flow Research Collective and Stanford neuroscientist, Dr. David Eelman. The conscious mind can process the headline of a newspaper, while the subconscious mind can process the entire newspaper. But what if there's a way to bring the entire newspaper into your conscious awareness? Just imagine how much better you'd be able to solve problems and make decisions. Well, here's how you can. So far, we've defined the root problem, but the main purpose of defining the root problem is so we can pose the question. That is the question our subconscious can mull on and pattern match and search for the answer. This question is how we coax the rest of the newspaper to the surface. For example, by going through the previous steps, let's say you discover that the problem isn't just how can we increase leads, but actually how can we increase net free cash flow in our business? Well, now you need a question that you can feed your subconscious so that it can help solve the problem for you. That question might be, what are the most effective ways to generate and sustain increased cash flow in the next quarter? By formulating this question, you activate your adaptive subconscious, the brain's rapid response unit that psychologist Timothy Wilson calls the silent operator, an evolved high-speed information processing system that excels in pattern recognition. The silent operator rapidly scans your environment, your memories, and social cues. When you get a gut feeling, that's your silent operator built 
from a lifetime of experiences coming to knock on your door. Recruiting the silent operator is the gold standard for flow-based intuitive decision-making, system one. It's like having a mental search engine able to instantly pull up the right solution among millions of options. Instead of making decisions from the newspaper's headline alone, the silent operator scours and brings to the surface the rest of the newspaper's information. Much of this information is what Tor Nortranders, author of The User Illusion, calls exformation. Exformation is data that we consciously discard. Yes, because our senses register this data, it gets stored in our subconscious. Exformation is all the details you're not consciously aware of, but that you're still absorbing the ambient noise of the coffee shop, the barely perceptible scent of fresh paint, the fleeting expressions on a stranger's face, all of this exformation is discarded by our conscious minds before a coherent conscious experience is presented to us. This data filtering process showing us the headline of the newspaper rather than the whole newspaper is crucial for our survival as handling the full scope of information that's out there in the world would completely overload our brain. That's partially because the conscious mind can only process a trickle of 40 to 2,000 bits of information per second. Meanwhile, research from the University of Pennsylvania indicates that your subconscious mind processes 400 billion bits per second. If your conscious mind is a lone fisherman with a fishing rod, think of your unconscious as an industrial trawler, gobbling up swaths of data, all that exformation. And here's the key. Though this exformation is discarded from our conscious mind, it still enters and feeds our subconscious. This means that your intuitive gut feelings aren't random but our data points amassed from an extensive subconscious analysis of billions of bits of information. This rapid adaptive subconscious information processing is also the answer to the question, why do we have insights in the shower? The mechanism behind this boils down to a network change in the brain. When we engage in lightly stimulating activity, like driving, showering, the conscious mind is occupied with the easy task. This is automaticity at work. This switches your cognition from the task positive network, which is active when you're focused and converged on a task, to the default mode network, which is active when you dislodge your attention from a task and let your mind wander instead. This allows your adaptive subconscious to run high level simulations at astronomical speeds. Think of it as a neural supercomputer accessing a galaxy of exformation, each fragment seasoned with the juice of lived experience. It's the silent operator doing its job, extracting exformation on your behalf. So how do we leverage all that processing power? Well, there's a few things. Number one is to first externalize the problem. At this point, you've identified the root problem and have formulated a question. Now you need to write it down for a few reasons. Number one is that neuroscience shows that when you actively generate information, such as through writing, you increase the likelihood that the information will move from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. This fuels the incubation process. Writing also activates what's known as the reticular activating system, the RAS, a bundle of neurons in your brainstem. The RAS acts like a mental filter, prioritizing information that you need to pay attention to. By writing down your problem, you're effectively telling your brain to allocate more resources to solving it. The next step to leveraging the processing power of your subconscious is the incubation itself. The key here is to surrender control to the silent operator. To let the incubation process take over, stay away from the problem and do other things while your subconscious solves it for you. So instead of pounding away at a problem or decision at your desk, go take a shower. This allows the subconscious mind to take over the information processing responsibilities. Depending on the problem's magnitude, this could range from hours to multiple days to weeks where you're incubating on the question that you have written down subconsciously without consciously exerting cycles on it. 90% of decisions don't need to be made today, usually of 48 hours or more. If the decision needs to be made immediately, go for a quick walk or do something stimulating but not taxing, gardening, cleaning, playing pool, it all works for two reasons. First, these activities can sufficiently distract the conscious mind, allowing the subconscious mind to continue processing information. Second, these lightly stimulating physical activities can induce transient hyperfrontality. As mentioned, transient hyperfrontality is a temporary down regulation of the prefrontal cortex, which is partially responsible for the increased cognition, creativity, and decision-making found in flow state. What doesn't work is TV or video gaming or scrolling social media. All these require too much mental processing to do the trick. Now, if the incubation phase will take multiple days, it's okay to do whatever activities you want. Your subconscious will still be processing the problem. The final step to leveraging your adaptive subconscious for flow-based decision-making is to extract the juice from your subconscious. At this stage, you sit back down and you start writing down solutions to the problem that you defined hours or days or even weeks earlier. 
Usually after a minute or two of writing, the decision will start to pour through. This is simple, but the results are often stunning. This process leverages all of the neurobiological power of the subconscious, extracting the otherwise discarded exformation to fuel your decision-making. What you'll also find is that often a decision will become very clear. The silent operator will knock on your door through a gut instinct before you even have to sit back down to write down the answer to that decision. As you master this flow-based decision-making process, you'll begin to find the idea of deliberately sitting down to solve problems by thinking them through consciously laughable compared to the speed, enjoyment, and improved decision-making quality you will get by using the flow-based decision-making process. And over time, your intuitive decision-making will speed up, even without running the process. Some industry veterans can assess a candidate on the spot. Some investors know whether to invest by seeing a pitch deck alone because they've done it thousands of times. As an added bonus, when you tap into flow-based decision-making, you'll experience something called the cognitive bias high. The cognitive bias high occurs when you make a decision that is counter to the distorted decision-making the cognitive bias is resulting, which is often a consequence of over-indexing on system two deliberative thinking. You experience the cognitive bias high when you make the hard but right decision and rise above what you've been evolutionarily adapted for. That is the cognitive bias. I experienced this with my business partner, Stephen Collar, a few years back. The team and I had poured considerable time and resources into creating a new product. After months of work, the product was almost fully ready and we had booked a studio in LA to put the final touches on it. But once we were sitting together under the bright lights with the cameras rolling, I just knew deep in my bones that the product wasn't a good fit for our brand and vision. I looked at Steven and I knew he was thinking the same thing. Despite the very loud sunk cost bias that could have urged us to move forward with it without hesitation, we immediately made the decision to drop the product. No deliberation, no second guessing, no pros and cons list, just pure unadulterated flow-based intuition with the silent operator knocking on our door and us trusting that instinct. 99% of people are not able to make these types of decisions because they can't elevate themselves above their cognitive biases. But as you get better flow-based decision-making, you'll experience the cognitive bias high more often. It's like having night vision in a dark forest where others stumble over cognitive biases, you'll see clearly and navigate easily. It's a beautiful feeling. You now understand how to leverage the hardware your biology gives you to turn your brain into a 24 seven problem solving supercomputer. No more self doubt eroding your confidence. You move rapidly from insight to action, making the right call at the right time. This process leverages the full potential of your mental hardware. You leverage the flood of exformation that most people discard. Through flow-based decision-making, you'll feel a calm confidence in your choices and conserve cognitive resources for where they matter most. Now, one last thing to bear in mind, your decision-making is only as good as your rumination. So to deepen and accelerate your flow-based decision-making, the key is to maximize the creativity of your default mode network, the part of the brain that is active around the clock even while you sleep. Click the video on the screen now to find out how to do that.